All right, let's look briefly at Rutherford's gold foil experiment. And now I'm not going to go into too much mathematical depth. Um, this, this gets into the, the heart of scattering theory, which is really fascinating and is something that you would go on to if you were looking into uh, studying nuclear and particle physics. But at the level of just kind of understanding how this experiment works, I, I think it's okay to kind of gloss over some of the ma mathematical minutia here. Now, specifically what we have is uh, you begin with a source that emits a, a series of what Rutherford actually identified were doubly charged helium nuclei which is exactly what we now understand to be alpha particles. So if you recall, uh, Rutherford won two different Nobels, and um, neither of them were for this mention, but he was the one that actually solved Marie Curie's uh, discovery that there are two different types of radiation, and by identifying one of them as doubly charged helium, it's literally just two protons, and we now know two, two, two neutrons. So that's what we're shooting at. Two very small nuclei that have literally just escaped a nuclear, a nuclear active um, element of uranium or plutonium or something. That's literally what those bigger uh, radioactive elements spit out, is alpha particles. So we place one of those nearby a gold foil, we collimate the beam, meaning we get everything run in the same direction, or we weed out the ones that are dispersed at different angles. And so you get a nice beam of particles, and you know what the flux of that is. You know how much energy per second is passing a given you know, radius here. And then now you pass it through a very thin foil of gold atoms. And you, you need to make that foil as thin as possible because what you want is you have a detector screen on the other side. And you allow it to, first of all, you start with that detector screen immediately behind that, that gold foil. And you observe what percent of that original incoming intensity is detected on your screen. And as it turns out, excuse me, the... Um, the, the result is that you get an awful lot of particles that, that, that pass directly through. That almost, and not quite, but almost all of them will indeed pass right through that, that gold foil. And so at theta equals zero, there is a very high peak. Now, it's not exactly at theta equals zero. There is some spread. And what that tells us is as these small helium nuclei pass through this layer of gold atoms, some of them are deflected by maybe a third of a degree, or maybe a degree and a half, or something like that. Uh, and our understanding is that they get too close to some of those positive particles that might make up that gold foil. Now, kind of, you're probably viewing this in your head according to the nuclear and atomic model that we now understand to be correct. Um, get rid of that a little bit from your head to view it how they did here. Because, again, they knew that there's negative and po positive matter, and they're this reaction here would be consistent with it. If there's little clumps of positive and negative stuff, a, a, a particle, a charged particle that goes through will likely be deflected a little bit if it gets a little bit too close. But what they didn't expect is as that detector screen comes over here, and as they get further than 90 degrees, every once in a while they're getting a hit. Uh, they're, they're, they're getting a count. Uh, they're not taking a hit, to be clear. Uh, they're, they're getting a hit on their detector screen, meaning that they are measuring, they're detecting a particle that has somehow, in other words, uh, been deflected at an angle of, let's say, 80 degrees, 90 degrees, 120 degrees. And then, even strangely, they come back over here, and they're still getting, uh, they're still getting uh, particles, and, and a, a fairly high number of particles that are reflecting almost exactly back where they came from. So, to, to kind of give a little more insight here, what the mathematical model was at the time, again, 1911 or so, was that we knew there were small, what we, what we understand, what we correlate with the negative sign, charges, electrons, and so within a clump of matter, there are small, very low mass, we had already measured the mass, again, Thompson and Millikan, sm very small negative particles there. And the rest of that matter we knew was heavier. The, 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 those electrons didn't contribute much to the mass of, of any sort of element. And so we knew that there must have to be more massive um, stuff there that also contained a, a positive charge. And we viewed that positive charge to be, instead of containing little packets, Thompson's model, in fact, was, you can kind of think of it as just positiveness spread a little bit throughout everywhere where everyone's just a little bit happy, but no one is ecstatic. Basically, we've spread out that happiness, or we've spread out that positivity randomly, completely uniformly throughout, and there's a small amount of non-zero positivity everywhere throughout that blob. We call that the, the plum pudding model. 
Uh, now, if any of you have, have ever ate plum pudding, uh, please tell me what it is. This was named 100 years ago when I, I guess that was a popular thing. I don't know. Um, pudding, to me, is what I know of as normal. And pudding is a <laughs> very li liquidish uh, medium. And so that's what we viewed it as. Just positive, uh, spread out, just uniformly. But in this model here, there's no way that a small positively charged particle could come through that and somehow or in other words get ejected backwards. But that's exactly what happened. And um, specifically it happens something like, you know, one hundred thousandth of the time or, or something. And so um, based on that, we knew that if there's actually deflections that are occurring like that, that this plum pudding model couldn't accurately explain that. You know, if you're going to fire, you know, fire a cannon through, you know, like a big tub of pudding, that cannonball is going to go through, but just it might be slowed down a little bit. What, uh, what Rutherford described here, or his analogy was, it's like if you find, if I are a hundred kilogram shell at a, a, a piece of tissue paper and it comes right back at you. That's how, that's one way to describe what the, how unpredicted this effect was. And the only way that could be true would be that if most of this charge here was condensed into a little tiny uh, a fraction of the volume of it. And he knew that had to be true because the vast majority, almost like 10, to, within one part, about 10 to the 5 or so, of the signal that was incident passed through. It's only that tiny, you know, one part in 10 to the 5 or so that gets reflected at those high angles that must have actually contacted or come very close to that compressed, very high density amount of mass and charge. And so this was where he was able to accurately depict an atom as instead of a negative thing and a whole bunch of random positiveness around, he said, no, it must be that negative thing with a little bit of positiveness right there. And they kind of come in a packet. I don't want to pretend like he said they, they move around in a circle. That was bore. Um, but he said that the, the, the positive matter and the positive charge is clumped in very high densities and it is not spread uniformly throughout like we had previously thought.